Let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer, and we will pick up here in Acts chapter 8. Father, once again, we are so thankful. Uh, thank you for Flynn's laugh. Uh, just had his seventh birthday. May you bless him, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your word. We pray that as we open up your word, we'd have ears to hear what your uh, spirit is saying to us. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace in all of our lives. And we pray, Lord, that your hand would be strong upon the uh, Jewish people, upon the IDF and, and all that's going on in Israel and around them. We pray, Father, for uh, your hedge protection around uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. We pray that you would uh, continually strengthen him and encourage him. He's taken out more terrorists in the last two days than we have in 20 years. And so uh, he's being used as an instrument in your hands. And we, and we pray, Father, for uh, their protection. And we pray that many of the Jewish people would come to know Jesus as their Messiah uh, during this time. Because we know uh, that it's you behind the scenes, and may you open up their eyes to see how awesome you are, Lord. And we just commit our ways to you, pray that we would see how awesome you are in our lives as well. Uh, you are the, the God who saves. You're the one who heals. You're the one who uh, cleanses and forgives. And we just want to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So turn to um, Acts chapter 8 as we continue our study in the book of Acts. We saw last time in chapter 7, it ended with the death of the first martyr uh, of the followers of Christ. Uh, Stephen was stoned and you know killed. That spirit-filled man in the natural realm uh, I'm sure many of the believers and, you know, people like us would say, what a shame, you know, that God would allow this bold witness to cr of Christ to be uh, put to death in such a way. Uh, on the surface, it might seem like Stephen's martyrdom was a terrible tragedy, a waste of a young man's life. Um, I remember when I got saved in 1977, that was the, the year that Keith Green started his ministry. And then in 1982, the Lord took him home when he was 28 years old. And, uh, you know, I thought, what a tragedy. Lord, why? You know, he, he had so many people that were touched. I mean, millions of lives were touched by Keith Green's ministry. And at 28 years old, you know, the Lord takes him and two of his little children home with him and the others in that plane that crashed. And it was just a, a horrible time. And you just kind of wonder, why, Lord? And, um, and, and yet you, you got to come to the conclusion that God is infinitely wiser than we are. His ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are above our thoughts, and he's always got a plan and purpose, even if we don't see it. And I know that God used uh, Keith Green's death in, in amazing ways, where he was, uh, even during his death, many more people were shaken. Uh, a lot of people were woke out of their uh, routine comfort zone Christianity. Um, God's got a plan and purpose in it all. I mean, some of you might remember, I was born that year, but in 1956, when uh, Jim Elliott and the four other missionaries down in Ecuador were killed by the Rowani tribe. Um, you know, everybody thought, what a tragedy. I think Life Magazine, uh, National Geographic, a lot of them had huge articles about that. Uh, the Rowani, Rowani tribe was, you know, unreached, uncivilized, you might say. Um, if you have questions about it, see Aaron. He was actually with that tribe. Uh, and he got to meet a couple of the guys that were on the killing party that kill, killed Jim Elliott and others but you know when elizabeth elliot goes back and, and others went back they lead him to christ and, and god did an amazing work there and uh you know tragic death but god has done amazing things uh, with the rwanis since you know keep them in prayer also if you want to know what monkey brains taste like ask aaron as well he got to eat all the delicacies when he was there so Anyway, that's what God did with the death and martyrdom of Stephen here in the book of Acts. Uh, prior to Stephen's death, the gospel message of Jesus Christ was just there in Jerusalem. It wasn't really spreading like Jesus told him it needs to spread from there. And so, you know, it would spread because of persecution. Now, Jesus says in John 12, verse 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, and he's speaking about himself being, you know, the first you know, one, you know, ultimately put to death the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces 
much grain or much fruit. In other words, God was going to allow the death of His only begotten Son, Jesus, to bring in a huge harvest of souls. And as a result, His death on the cross, His resurrection from the dead, that's the seed that has spread throughout the world. Now billions of people over the last 2,000 years have come to faith in Jesus and have received everlasting life. So, Again, before Jesus ascended up into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he told them that they were to wait in Jerusalem, and when they'd be empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit would come upon them, and then they would be witnesses of Christ in Jerusalem. Okay, that was the first place, and that's where it's been. That's where it's been isolated for a few years now. It was just there in Jerusalem. But Jesus said it would also go to Judea, Israel, Samaria, the half-breeds, half-Jews, half-Gentiles, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we'll see that in chapter 10 when it finally goes to the Gentiles. And so at this point, it's just there. They're not moving. They're not growing uh, outwardly. There are many people getting saved in Jerusalem, but Jesus allowed this to happen to scatter them, as we'll see here in a moment. Um, the Lord used Stephen's death. It basically jumpstarts Christian evangelism. And once again, it proves the fact that what Satan means for evil, bringing his persecution against the early believers, that God has a way of turning it around and bringing something amazing out of it. So look at chapter 8. Uh, the first verse says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. Remember, that's uh, Saul of Tarsus. He gets saved in chapter 9, becomes the Apostle Paul. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So notice how it states they were all scattered. The word scattered means to uh, scatter seed. It's the same word used when the farmer goes out and sows seed out into his field. Satan is driving them out of Jerusalem Again, with the desire to divide and to uh, conquer God's people, but from God's perspective, His people weren't being divided. They were being relocated so that the gospel might be multiplied, that you know people would come to know the Lord. God was planting them throughout the different regions um, so that the gospel would be preached in other areas. That's why it's important to be in God's Word. You know, to have the whole counsel of God's Word, because then we can see things from God's perspective. A lot of times, you know, we go through a trial, we go through a tribulation, we go through a hardship, and we just look at what's happening to me. This hurts, Lord. This is bad, Lord. And then we need the big picture of what is God doing in the midst of this, because He's always going to work all things together for good to those that love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. We may not see it at the moment, but we need to see the big picture because we, He wants us to see that He is with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Uh, again, the old adage is true. Trials will either make us better or they will make us bitter. The same trial, the same problem will make you better or will make you bitter. And so when you find yourself in a situation that is just ripping you up inside, that is pulling you down, that is stressing you out, then look to Jesus and try to get his perspective on the situation. Because again, there's very important lessons he's trying to teach us as we go through these various problems that we face. He's always trying to teach us something during that uh, trial. So look at these verses in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. It says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present time. And again, earlier in Hebrews, it says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he disciplines. You know, he corrects us because he loves us. So no chastening or discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So again, it's like if you go through a surgery, let's say you break your leg or your arm, it'll be in a cast for six weeks. It's painful. It hurts, but it's bringing, you know, healing when the cast comes off and so forth. And so, we want to see that healing take place in our lives as we are disciplined by the Lord. He, he spanks us because He loves us to get us on the right path with Him once again. He says in verse 14, Pursue peace with all people and holiness 
without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So again, we don't want that root of bitterness coming, on, uh, coming into our hearts. You know, we need to call upon Him in those difficult days. Don't call upon the world. Don't look to the world to have the solutions for you. Jesus alone has what you need. The world doesn't have what you need. The world will give you what you may want. It'll try to minister to your flesh, but only Jesus can minister to our hearts, to our minds, to our soul. Jesus will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We can cast all of our cares upon Him, knowing that He cares for us. Um, again, you know, He will supply all that we need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Look at verse 3. It says, Therefore, wait a minute, where am I? Yeah, verse 3, as for Paul, Saul, he made, notice his word, havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Again, he'll get saved in the next chapter by Jesus, and he'll become known as the Apostle Paul, but what an enemy uh, of the early believers at this time. Um, it says he made havoc of the church. The word havoc literally means a wild animal tearing up its prey. You know, we've all seen those, you know, National, Ge Ge National Geographic shows that, you know, you see the, the beast going after the antelope, you know, the lion or tiger or something, going after it and it just mangles up that prey. That's Paul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He was trying to destroy these followers of Jesus. He was like a madman in pursuit of these Jews that were now followers of the, their Messiah, Jesus. And he would go into houses. He would drag them out. He would put them in prison. He had some put to death. When he persecuted the church, he did it with a clear conscience, he says, because he truly believed he was serving God by protecting, um, protecting the Jewish faith. That's really what he thought. And so he had to keep people away from the, these Jesus people. Later on, we see, look at these verses in Acts chapter 22. In verse 4, it says, and, and again, he gives his testimony numerous times in the New Testament. And, and Paul writes here, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Look at verse 19 of Acts 22. It says, so, and this is again, right after he's, you know, Jesus confronts him and he finds out this is Jesus. And so he says, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. Again, we saw that last time. And guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Now, over in um, Acts chapter 26, starting in verse um, 9, again, this is part of his testimony. Paul says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. You know, he was on his way to Damascus when Jesus got a hold of his life. Now it's in uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 12. Chapter 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Here he gives his testimony again. You all have a testimony, by the way. This is who I was before Christ. This is who I am after Christ. And that's what Paul used many times. This is who I was before. He could identify with people. He could identify with people's anger and bitterness and animosity towards others. And this is who I am now because I'm a new creation in Christ. So in uh, 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 12, um, 1 Timothy 1, Good grief. i got to slow down. I shouldn't have put so many electrolytes in my water this morning. It's like, yeah. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. I know that these are some of my favorite verses. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me 
because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, that means a violently arrogant man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Again, he thought he was doing God a favor by having these uh, Jews who were following a false prophet named Jesus arrested and some put to death. That's what Paul thought he was doing until Jesus got a hold of him and he realized he's not a false Messiah. He is our Messiah. He says, verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, <clears throat> that in me first, so here's the reason I got saved, he says, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. In short, Paul hated Christians, these followers of Jesus. He hated Jesus. I mean, he just had hate in his heart. And he had the full support of the religious leaders there in Jerusalem. And I bet there's a lot of people praying for Saul of Tarsus. A lot of believers praying for him. And I bet most of their prayers were, God, get him. God, strike him down. God, don't let him do this anymore. You know, take him out. And, you know, rightfully so. But in time, God did get him. But much to the surprise of uh, the, the early church, God did not strike him down. He did not kill him. He saved him. And it was amazing. He says it was God's exceedingly abundant grace towards me. Again, we'll see this in greater detail in chapter 9, but suffice it to say for now, Paul's point is if God could save me, he could save anybody. If God could save somebody that was that hard, that antagonistic towards Jesus, then don't give up praying for those that you know that are that way. Maybe fellow family members, neighbors, people you work with. I mean, you might think, God can't save them. They're too hard. They've got hearts of steel. Well, I had a lot of people praying for me because my heart was a heart of steel before I got saved. I would curse them out. I would tell them to take a hike. I'd tell them all kinds of horrible things. And then God finally broke me. He got a hold of my life. So don't give up on praying for those you think, there's no way. Yes, there is. It's called Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So after he gets saved here, Paul's heart's desire, his prayer to God was that all Israel would be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. That was his heart. He was antagonistic towards these early believers, and he becomes an early believer. And instead of hating those that he was formerly working for, he prayed for them. He wanted them to come to the same conclusion that he did, that Jesus Christ is our Messiah. So don't give up on those around you. Keep praying for them. Look at verse 4. It says, Therefore, those who are scattered went everywhere, Preaching the word. Again, that word scatter is the same word, scattered like seed. It's like the proverbial, if you know somebody hands you a lemon, make lemonade. If you get driven out of town, then look for an opportunity. God's opening up another door. You can share the truth with somebody around you. You might have an attitude like, Lord, I don't know why you're allowing these things to happen in my life, but as long as you have me here, help me to be light and salt to those around me. You might be wondering, why am I here in Grand Junction? <laughs> How do I end up here? Well, God opens up doors for us, and, and we just go through the doors He opens for us. Don't grumble and complain. You know, when we first moved here, people were like, why are you moving here? Because at the time, literally, everybody's moving out of here. I wish we had money, because houses were like $25,000 downtown. But we didn't have any money, so it didn't matter. But good grief, everybody's leaving. We're like, man, this is great. We're away from the gangs. We're away from, you know, the issues here in Southern California. This is, it wasn't paradise, but, you know. So, whatever God, wherever he moves you, then look for opportunities to serve him. Look at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. You remember Philip? 
He's one of the original seven deacons we saw in chapter 6. You know, they, they prayed, and, and John and Peter and the rest of them said, Choose from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and will appoint you to be table waiters. And they were the original deacons. We saw Stephen. He was the one that was martyred in chapter 7. And now we have Philip. He's another one of those deacons. And so he is run out of town, so to speak. He's out of Jerusalem. And, you know, he is now in the role of an evangelist. And God will use him in tremendous ways to preach the gospel to the people. He's going to find himself in Samaria. So Jerusalem first, Acts 1.8 then Judea, Israel, then Samaria. That's where Philip finds himself in Samaria. Then in chapter 10, uh, the Gentiles will come to Christ. But he's one of those guys that the Lord allowed to be scattered so he'd be like seed when persecution hit. He's a great example because instead of grumbling and complaining about his situation, why me, Lord? Why am I having to leave you know, Jerusalem, my home. Why am I stuck out here in Samaria? I don't like the Samaritans. Philip was able to see things through the eyes of the Lord. He got God's perspective, and the Holy Spirit opens up his eyes to see these people need Jesus. These people need salvation. And that's the exciting thing about walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. When you're open to what God is wanting to do in your life, then it's amazing the doors of opportunity he gives you. And when you go through those open doors, just by that simple faith, and you don't even know, I'm not sure what's on the other side, but I'll go through it, Lord, and then you're there, and all of a sudden He gives you wisdom, He gives you discernment, He gives you opportunity to be light and salt to those on the other side. So look at verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Again, here's another deacon used by God to do, do miraculous things. Some people say, well, it only happened with the apostles. Once the apostles died out, then all these miracles stopped. No, here's another deacon, another table waiter that God is doing miraculous things through. Somebody might think, well, why didn't he send the apostles? Because God can do it through a deacon. He can do it through you. You know, he can do it through me. He can use any of us to go and pray for somebody. You know, God's the one that saves. God's the one that heals. You know, I've prayed for people and God has healed them. I prayed for people and they, they weren't healed. So it's not me. I don't like, oh, man, I just didn't have enough faith. It's like God's got a plan. He's got a purpose in this. Sometimes he heals people. Sometimes he doesn't. But it's not me who does anything. It's just saying, here I am, Lord, use me. So God can use anybody to accomplish his plans and purposes. All that to say, don't be afraid to go up to somebody you see is hurting and struggling and say, hey, can I pray for you? You know, God can use you to do something amazing. Don't be afraid to share the good news with people. They need to know that God loves them, that Jesus died for their sins. We're all members of the same body. Only Jesus is the head of the body. We're just body parts. And each one of us are equal at the foot of the cross. So nobody is more important than anybody else in here. Nobody is less important. God can and he will use you if you let him. Look at verse 7. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed. So here's demons, you know, being cast out of people by Philip and through the Lord. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So this is the city of Samaria. Why was there such great joy? Because the people were being touched by Jesus, spiritually saved, physically healed. God's doing a great work here. The good news that they could go to heaven, they could have their sins forgiven. If they would receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that brings joy wherever Jesus is received. There's always great joy. In all truthfulness, joy should be one of the primary attributes of everyone who calls himself a follower of Jesus. I mean, I look at people who call themselves Christians, and I wonder, why are they so joyless? Why, why is there no happiness in their life? I know joy and happiness are two different things. Joy is an eternal thing. It, it's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. Joy should never be not part of our lives. It doesn't mean we always go around whistling and happy, happy, joy, joy. Well, joy, joy, yeah happy happy 
But it just simply means no matter what you're going through, you have that joy knowing, hey, if I die, I'm going to be with Jesus in heaven. That should bring joy into your life. Just having that stability in your heart that you belong to the Lord. But I see some Christians, and I'm like, where's the joy? Where's the joy of knowing that your sins have been paid for? Where's the joy of knowing that you are forgiven, you're cleansed, you're a new creation in Christ? Where's the joy of knowing that when you die, you're going to be in His presence and glory? There's great joy when you really do experience the risen Lord and Savior in your life. Psalm 45, verse 7. This is a messianic psalm. This is speaking of Jesus. It's also quoted in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9, speaking of Jesus. But here the psalm says about Jesus, You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Why is joy and gladness so closely linked to Jesus Christ? Because he loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. That should be true of all of us. Maybe you don't have a lot of joy because you're leaning towards the wickedness side of stuff instead of walking in righteousness. Obviously, Jesus does not straddle the fence as far as righteousness and wickedness are concerned. But too many Christians do. Again, the most joyless people I know are those who are one foot in the world. I can do these things because I'm covered by grace. No. And then they got one foot in the Lord, but they're always miserable. Stop jumping the fence. You know, we're in green pastures. We've got clean waters. You know, he's, he's feeding us. He's nourishing us here. So why jump the fence into the thorns and thistles and the weeds of the world? You can't be double-minded. We need to continually stay in the Lord's field of righteousness, stop playing in the world's field of wickedness. Otherwise, you will be a miserable, sourpuss Christian. And, and I don't like it. I mean, I've been there, but again, we don't need to stay there. That sourpuss kind of Christian where you're just miserable all the time. We shouldn't be when you know who Jesus is, what he's done for us. A great example of this is seen in the life of King David. David had everything. The Lord blessed him tremendously. He had the joy of the Lord. Until he looks and goes, oh, look at her, Bathsheba. I'm going to take her for myself. She ends up getting pregnant. Uh-oh, i got to cover my tracks. Has Uriah, her husband, put to death? And he thought he got away for it for a whole year. And then Nathan the prophet shows up. And he gives the illustration of, all oh, this guy, he's got all these sheep, and somebody's traveling, coming through. And, and this guy's got all these sheep, but he won't slaughter one of the sheep for his guests. He goes to the guy that's only got one little sheep, and he takes that from the guy that's poor and kills it. And David's like, oh, that's so horrible. That guy deserves to die. And then Nathan says, you're the man. You're the one, David. You had everything. And this is what you did. And then David, he was torn up inside. Not just because he got busted, but he was torn up for that whole year just trying to cover up his own sin. It must have been brutal. So he finally repents. Psalm 51 is the psalm of repentance. And part of that says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Because when you're not walking in that freedom and that peace and, and just experiencing the love of God, then there's no joy. I mean, sin had robbed David of the joy of the Lord. And he was miserable. Well... If joy is lacking in your life today, take spiritual inventory. See if there's anything you need God to cleanse your heart from, purge your mind from. Are you holding something back that the Lord wants to get rid of? Are you walking in unforgiveness towards someone who hurt you in the past? Is there bitterness? Is there animosity? Is there anger towards somebody in the present? You need to turn that to God. You need to turn it over to Him and let Him deal with it. Otherwise, you're going to be miserable. Are you straddling the fence? One foot in Jesus and the other in sin or rebellion. Only in Christ will you discover and experience great joy, great peace, just that unconditional love of the Lord. So David does repent, and one of the great psalms, Psalm 32, uh, he describes this whole scene. He describes what's going on in his heart because he was holding on to this. 
trying to cover up his sin. And then when he finally releases it, repents, confesses to the Lord. Notice this Psalm 32. We'll read through it quickly. It says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, covered by the blood. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no conceit. Iniquity is, there's a line drawn in the sand by God. Don't cross that line. I'm going to cross that line. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's iniquity. And that's what David did. He crossed that line. He knew he was not to cross. When I kept silent, now he's talking about that year where he's trying to cover up. My bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. I mean, you're just like, ugh, miserable. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Just dried up. I acknowledged my sin to you. In my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. What does confession mean? To agree with. So I'm agreeing with God. Now that I realize I'm busted, I'm, conf- I'm, tr- I'm giving this to you, God. I agree with you. What I've done is horrible sin. I confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And that says Selah, or pause. Think about that. Think about Saul of Tarsus when he gets saved. I mean, can you? I can imagine just all the different people he hurt, people he had put to death, people he drug out, families he broke up, all those things running through his brain. And he's like, all this, Lord, you're going to forgive me of? If you can forgive me, you can forgive anybody. And here's David. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. You washed me clean. Pause on that. I mean, if God can forgive David, if he can forgive Saul of Tarsus, turn him into the Apostle Paul, is there anything you've done that God cannot cleanse you of? I don't think so. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. Again, we can pray to the one that knows us, who loves us in spite of ourselves. In a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You know, in other words, when the floods are trying to take you out for good, it won't come near you because you're putting your faith and trust in the Lord. You're standing on the rock of Jesus and not the shifting sands of the world. You're turning it over to him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of, de- of deliverance. That song sound familiar? Was that Corey Ten Boom? Was that her hiding place? Yeah. Selah. Again, pause and think about that again for a moment. He's our hiding place. He's the one that preserves us. He surrounds me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eyes. So here God is now speaking to David. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and bridle, um, else they will not come near you. In other words, don't be stubborn. Don't be like the donkey. Don't be like the mule. Don't be stubborn, but just, okay, I surrender it, Lord. I give up. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but but, but <laughs> he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for what? Joy, all you upright in heart. We should have joy because of what Christ has done for us. Because the Messiah has set us free. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He's brought us into his kingdom, his kingdom. We belong to him. He set us free. What joy we should be identified with. Now, God's working powerfully here among the Samaritans. But every time God works, guess who's on the scene ready to pounce? Satan. He does not appreciate what God is doing in your life or anybody else's life. He wants to try to rip you off, pull you down, pull you back into the things of the world. So he's just looming in the background, waiting for his opportunity to mess things up. Look at verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon. Now this is one of those guys, he's hard to figure out. He is just a weirdo. I mean, he's like a Judas Iscariot. I'll just say 
that's where I put him in the camp with Judas because you'll th see things. It's like, well, he seems like he believes. He gets baptized. What's going on with this guy? Anyway, here's a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Then they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. So here we're introduced to Simon the sorcerer. Normally the word sorcerer is pharmakia, which will, you get into the spiritual realm of drugs and different things. This word for sorcery means a magician. This guy is just a very, very good magician. But he's astonishing people. They think this is the power of God. Any of you ever watch, I hate to admit it, America's Got Talent? <laughs> I've, I haven't watched it at all. You, I don't know any of the winners even, but sometimes I'll flip it on. It's like, man, this guy's really good. He can do some amazing tricks. How is he doing that? And, and people are astonished by his tricks. It's just tricks. There's a way you can figure it out, but it's amazing. So that's what he is doing. In fact, he is so good, people are saying, wow, this must be the power of God. He had a large following of people who thought he was somebody really special but again, he's just a good magician. Unfortunately, there's a lot of good magicians in pulpits that are great at twisting the Word of God. You ever seen these, I don't know if they're magicians or not, they'll blow up a balloon and turn it into a chihuahua or something. That's what people do with the Word of God. They blow it up, look at this, we just made the... It's like, that's not what the Word says, that's not in context. And they come up with all kinds of weird stuff. Anyway, that's where he is. That's why we need the whole counsel of God's word. Verse 12, But when they, speaking of the Samaritan people, they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, who is giving them the gospel, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. Hmm. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. Now again, it's a very interesting picture of Simon. On the surface, it appears that he gets saved. Seems like he turns his life over. He believes he gets baptized. But as we'll see, his heart wasn't right. As we'll see, he wants the power of the Spirit. He's willing to pay Peter to teach him, because that's what magicians did. Magicians would pay other magicians to learn their tricks. You give them a lot of money to learn that trick. He's going to offer them money so he can do whatever tricks he's thinking that the, they're doing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, Jesus, and Peter's going to really lay into him. We'll see that next time, Lord willing. But anyway, there's a lot of people like this today. He was following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. Many people turn to Christ because I want my business to grow. They turn to Christ because he can make me healthy and wealthy. Or I'll turn to Christ because he can straighten out my spouse. There's hundreds of wrong reasons for following Jesus. Look at Judas Iscariot. He was there. He was sent out two by two. He did miracles. He cast out demons. But then Jesus says, you're a son of perdition. It'd be better if you were never born because he's going to end up in the lake of fire. He didn't know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He was in it for what he could get out of it. He had the money bag, it says. And he would take that out of the money bag for himself. He was in it for all the wrong reasons. There's a lot of people out there who call themselves Christians who will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. It says here he believed, was baptized, but it does not seem like his conversion was real. I say that for a couple of different reasons, but one of the things we see here is he believed. Well, that's an important word. Pisteo, it's the same word used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes, pisteo, in Him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's also used in James 2.19. Oh, you believe Jesus or God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe, even the demons believe, pisteo, and they tremble, because they know where they're going. So it's not just enough to have intellectual belief in Him. You must surrender your life to Him. 
Give yourself over to him. There are many people who have followed Jesus with wrong motives. In fact, Jesus says this in John 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should t testify of man, for he knew what was in man. In other words, he knew they were only following him because of what they could get out of him. They saw the miracles. They saw him feed people. I want that. They didn't want him as their Lord and Savior. They saw miracles. They saw bodies touched. But they wanted their flesh satisfied. Great example of this is when Jesus feeds the multitudes, get the little boys lunch, you know, two little fish, five little barley loaves. He multiplies it, feeds 5,000 men, it says, probably with their wives and their kids, probably 15,000 people or more. He feeds with this little lunchable. And so they're all satisfied. They're all full. And then it came, they came to take him by force. They wanted to make him king. And he tells them, why? Because I filled your bellies. That's what they wanted. And then he gets into chapter uh, 6 of John's gospel. And he tells them, that's why you're following me, because you're full. And then he starts talking about hard things. Well, you've got to eat the flesh of the Son of Man. You've got to drink his blood, or you have no part in me. And then they're like, you're getting weird now. And he tells them what it means. You've got to put your faith in me. You've got to believe in me as your you know, Savior, as the Messiah. They didn't want that. So it says the multitudes all started walking away. They were all leaving him because he was not doing what they wanted him to do. He wasn't the Messiah they wanted him to be. That's one of the reasons the first century Jews rejected him when he was here, because they wanted a political ruler to kick out the Romans, but Jesus came to die for sin. That's the greatest enemy. It wasn't the Romans. It was sin. That's why he came the first time. So all these people are walking away. In John chapter 6, verse 67, And Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Literally means you, you alone, have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? There's salvation in nobody else. You're the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but through you. So why do we follow Jesus? Again, to get a bigger car, to get a bigger house, to get our bellies filled, to straighten out our wife or our husband. That's not good reason. He can do those things. He can change those areas of our lives. But the bottom line is we follow Jesus because he alone can save us. He alone can forgive us of all of our sins. He alone is preparing a place for us in glory. He alone is coming for his bride, and he's going to take us home to be with him forever and ever. Only Jesus can bring us into a personal relationship with God the Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's why we follow him. Knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior and having a personal relationship with him is infinitely greater than any material blessing you could ever get in this life. If somebody says, I'll give you a billion dollars to turn your back on Jesus, would you take it? If you're thinking twice right now, then you better check your motives. A billion dollars? Wow. No. You'd say, absolutely not. I wouldn't trade anything in this world. You can give me the whole world. What does it profit a man to gain his, you know, to lose his soul and gain the whole world? It's all about Jesus. He's infinitely greater. Knowing him is infinitely greater than knowing things about Jesus, if you know what I mean by that. A lot of people know things about him, but to know him, that's what we're growing in that relationship with him. Get to know Jesus. Spend time in his word. Spend time in prayer. Follow him for who he is, because what Jesus has done for us is simply a reflection of who he is. He's the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the great I Am. He's the Lord. He's the Savior. He's the King of Kings. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. That's why we want to know Him more and follow Him. The more you get to know Christ, the more you're going to love Him, and the more you're going to trust Him, the more you're going to depend upon Him with every part of your life. 
Jesus will be at the forefront of everything you do. The world will know that you're his disciple by the love you have for one another. But you have to get to know him and allow the spirit to work in you and through you. If he's not at the forefront of everything you do, then you're compromising with the world. Look at verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Now this is interesting to me because the 12 apostles, they're still in Jerusalem. The, the, I think the leaders there were afraid of the 12 apostles. They weren't laying hands on them at this point, not until chapter 12, I think it is, where James will be put to death. But at this point, they're leaving them alone. So they decide, well, let's send Peter and John to Samaria. Let's send them out there and check things out, make sure it's legit and see how Philip's doing. And they'll end up laying hands on them and people will receive the Holy Spirit when they lay hands on them. But it's interesting to me because the last time John was in Samaria, the Samaritans didn't want anything to do with Jesus. In fact, they rejected Jesus. Remember what John said? Lord, should we call fire down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> should we just obliterate these Samaritans because they're not receiving you, Lord? That was his heart. In Luke 9, 55, it says, But he, Jesus, turned and rebuked them. James and John, and said, You don't know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So here's John back in Samaria, ministering to the very people that he wanted to destroy just a few months earlier. Again, that's the power of God's love. That's the power of salvation through Jesus Christ. He changes us from angry, bitter, hostile people. That's how I was before I got saved. And I had a heart of steel. Christians would witness to me about Jesus. I'd cuss them out. I'd tell them to take a hike and all kinds of bad stuff and, and that they were persistent. They kept loving me and it irritated me. I mean, I really, I wanted to punch a couple of these guys up, but they wouldn't stop. They were my teammates for one thing. And then I'd get kicked off the team and they were the ones that were there. Hey, Jeff, we still love you. And they're the ones that have witnessed to me. And then they're, you know, finally the Lord got a hold of my life. But don't give up on people. Anyway, here's John. He's back in Samaria. And, and now the love of Christ is upon him. And so putting Jesus in the midst of all of our arguments and disputes can change things radically. They go to Samaria. They see what God is doing in the hearts and lives of these new converts. Verse 15 says, of Peter and John, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And so the gospel is going forth. And again, the pattern in Jerusalem, then Judea, here Samaria, then into the uttermost parts of the earth, which we'll see going to the Gentiles in chapter 10, on the day of Pentecost, you remember when the 3,000 Jews got saved? Um, they turned to Christ for salvation. And it was Peter who told them, repent, and then get baptized in water, and then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So that's what happened with the, the, the initial outpouring of the Spirit. Repent, then get baptized, then the Spirit will come upon you. Here we see with these Samaritans, half Jews, half Gentiles, they received the gospel, they were baptized in water, then Peter and John lay hands on them, then they received the infilling, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But then, when we get to chapter 10, we see when he preaches the gospel to the Gentiles at Cornelius' household, it says, while Peter still preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, came into their lives, and saved them at that moment. And then they got baptized afterwards. And that seems to be the pattern that we see today as well. At the moment of salvation, when somebody comes to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. He seals us into the body of Christ. We're baptized or placed into the body of Christ. Not water baptism, but spiritual baptism. That's the pattern today. You're now a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away, behold, all things become new. As I've mentioned throughout the book of Acts, there's one baptism. 
um, that baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there are many fillings. And so for you and I today, as soon as you got saved, the Spirit came in you. And we talked about the three different you know, prepositions for the Holy Spirit. He's with, the Greek word is P-A-R-A, para, like Spanish, para. He, he's with everybody in the world. Not in them, but He's with everybody. Convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you might be feeling a tug on your heart, a knock on the door of your heart. You're like, what's going on here? And I'm feeling convicted. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Pointing people to Jesus. You need Jesus. He wants to save you. He loves you. And as soon as you receive the Lord, He comes into our lives. The Greek word is E-N, just like our I-N. He comes in us. But then, oh, okay, John chapter 20, before Jesus ascends, it says he breathes on the, the disciples, said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he came in them at that very moment. So on the day of Pentecost, he tells them, wait in Jerusalem for uh, the Holy Spirit. He's going to endue you with power from on high. And so when you wait there, you're going to have the Holy Spirit come upon you. E-P-I is the Greek word. That's when he comes upon you as rivers of living water, and he fills you up overflowing. That's the upon experience. That's what we see over and over again in Acts. Peter filled the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Peter filled the Spirit again in chapter 3 when they're going to the gate beautiful. Peter filled the Holy Spirit when he's standing before the Sanhedrin giving a testimony for Christ. We all have the Spirit in us. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. But how much of the Spirit is flowing out of our lives is dependent upon you and me. Because, Paul says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit who's within you. How do we do that? By getting worldly-minded, by tuning on, turning on something that we shouldn't be looking at, maybe going on a computer site that's not good. Well, you've immediately quenched the Spirit. You're not like, oh, rivers of living water, such joy. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at something that's really bad. You're quenching the Spirit. Doing anything of the world in the flesh is going to quench the Spirit. So we all need to be refreshed. We all need to be refilled time and time again as we are used by the Lord for His glory. So if there's a lack of joy in your life today, like David says, Search me, O God. Try me. See if there's a wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, show me something that's not right in my life. won't take very long. <laughs> if you're doing something wrong, it's like, oh, yeah. I forgot about that. No, you didn't. He brings it to mind. Then you know what you need to do? Confess it. Lord, I, I agree with you. That's what confession means. I agree with you, Lord. This is wrong. And then repent. Turn and go the opposite way that you're going. Go the way of God. Go the way with Jesus. And when you do, then you'll experience, like David says, the joy of your salvation. If Jesus doesn't seem as close to you today as he was before, guess who moved? It wasn't Jesus that moved, it was you, it was me. We start moving into the things of the world, and we put up this barrier, we put up this, we quench. It's like putting up a dam. You know, the river's flowing, let's dam it up a little bit here. We're going to put some rocks and stuff for the world. How come there's not much water coming out of my life? Why isn't the rivers flowing from my life? Because we're getting things in the way. We're letting things obstruct what Jesus wants to do. Let's go back to the Lord. Let's go before the Lord. Let's ask Him to bring us back to that first love relationship that He wants to have with us, like the church of Ephesus there in the book of Revelation. Jesus says, yeah, you're doing a lot of good stuff, but this one thing I have against you, you've left your first love. Remember where you've fallen, repent, and do the first works. So repentance isn't just a one-time deal for salvation. It's any time I start drifting into the things of the world, he says, no, turn from that. Repent, get back into this right relationship with me. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has everything to do with your relationship with him. Now, you've heard me say this before. I've got a marriage license. I don't know where it is right now, but I got a marriage license. Let's say it's, I got it in a frame and it's on the wall in our bedroom. There's my marriage license. Elizabeth, look, we're married. Yeah, for the last 44 years, we've been married. Okay, that's a legally binding document, right? Yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to go off to Las Vegas for a few months. I'll see you later. Am I still married? Yes. 
I do all kinds of bad stuff. Am I come home? Am I still married? Yes. Is my relationship good? No. <laughs> Who messed it up? I did. I'm still married. But what kind of relationship is that? That'd be horrible. That's what Jesus is saying. We're married. You're my bride. I don't want you doing this stuff. This stuff's going to just get in the way of that relationship I want to have with you. So humble yourself. Give it to the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit refresh you, refill you once again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this amazing example of just a simple deacon named Philip, full of the Holy Spirit, and yet you used him as an evangelist. He reached multitudes of people. You used him as an instrument in your hands to cast out demons, healed people that were lame. Lord, the enemy attacked, but Lord, we thank you that you were right there with Philip every step of the way. We thank you, Lord, for his testimony of your goodness and grace. And Lord, I'm sure he would say uh, some of the same things I've shared this morning, that you can use anybody that will simply humble ourselves before you and say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Here I, la here I am, Lord. Use me. Lord, open up doors that no one can shut and then give me the strength, the faith to go through those doors. And I might not see what's on the other side yet, but Lord, I know that if you open a door and I go through it and I'm just being light and salt, I know you will use me for your glory. And that's what it's all about. It'll be for our good, but it's always for your glory. And so, Father, I pray for each one of us here that wherever we are in our life, uh, wherever we are in our situations in this life, whatever we're doing, Lord, we know that you can do above and beyond anything we could hope or imagine if we just humble ourselves before you. I thank you, Lord. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I know the enemy wants to condemn. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. But we thank you for the convicting power of your Holy Spirit who is always just wanting to draw us closer to Jesus. And so, Lord, may we sense that conviction in our lives. If there's something there that's not pleasing to you, may we lay it down at the foot of the cross. We thank you that your blood is sufficient to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 7 tells us it's the blood of Christ that continually cleanses us of all sin. We thank you for the rivers of living water that washes us clean, that flows in and out of our lives. We need more of you and less of us. We thank you for your word and the washing that comes from the word of God. Lord, there's no reason for us to remain uh, dirty in this life when you have so much uh, and you've given us so much that cleanses us. You've given us your blood, you've given us the Holy Spirit, you've given us your word. And so, Lord, may we cling to the promises you have for us. May we let go of the things that the enemy is trying to use against us. Lord, if you have forgiven us, then may we walk in that forgiveness and stop looking back. Stop feeling guilt, guilt and shame over things that we have no control over now. But Lord, whatever the enemy wants to use for evil, we know that all things work together for good to those that love you and are the called according to your purpose. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here this morning, they have never given their life to you. They've never surrendered to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that this morning they would just say, Jesus, I need you. Lord, I know what I deserve, but I thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of all of my sins, dying in my place, shedding your blood so that I could be clean and forgiven. And so I receive you now as my Lord, my Savior. Fill me with your Spirit so I can walk in your ways. And Lord, for all of us as your children, strengthen us for, uh, for these days in which we live. We know that the enemy is still like a lion roaming about, seeking whom he may devour, but we are safe and secure in your hands. And may we always build our lives on the solid rock, the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. We know this world is passing away, but Lord, your word will endure forever. And we thank you 
that we have that relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the entire universe, and that you would love us so much. God, you're simply amazing, and your grace is exceedingly amazing. May we worship you now, Lord, and thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. And may we not look back and be pulled down by our past, but may we continue to look forward, press for the mark, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.